history concerning the pedigree of the chuzzlewit family as no lady or gentleman with any claims to polite breeding can possibly sympathize with the chuzzlewit family without being first assured of the extreme antiquity of the race it is a great satisfaction to know that it undoubtedly descended in a direct line from adam and eve and was in the very earliest times closely connected with the agricultural interest should it ever be urged by grudging and malicious persons that a chuzzlewit in any period of the family history displayed an overweening amount of family pride surely the weakness will be considered not only pardonable but laudable when the immense superiority of the house to the rest of mankind in respect of this ancient origin is taken into account it is remarkable that as there was in the oldest family of which we have any record a murderer and a vagabond so we never fail to meet in the records of old families with innumerable repetitions of the same phase of character indeed it may be laid down as a general principle that the more extended the ancestry the greater the amount of violence and vagabondism for in ancient days those two amusements combining a wholesome excitement with a promising means of repairing shattered fortunes were at once the ennobling pursuit and the healthful recreation of the quality of this land consequently it is a source of inexpressible comfort and happiness to find that in various periods of our history the chuzzlewits were actively connected with diverse slaughterous conspiracies and bloody frays it is further recorded of them that being clad from head to heel in steel of proof they did on many occasions lead their leather jerkin soldiers to the death with invincible courage and afterwards return home gracefully to their relations and friends there can be no doubt that at least one chuzzlewit came over with william the conqueror it does not appear that this illustrious ancestor came over that monarch to employ the vulgar phrase at any subsequent period inasmuch as the family do not seem to have been ever greatly distinguished by the possession of landed estate and it is well known that for the bestowal of that kind of property upon his favourites the liberality and gratitude of the norman were as remarkable as those virtues are usually found to be in great men when they give away what belongs to other people perhaps in this place the history may pause to congratulate itself upon the enormous amount of bravery wisdom eloquence virtue gentle birth and true nobility that appears to have come into england with the norman invasion an amount which the genealogy of every ancient family lends its aid to swell and which would beyond all question have been found to be just as great and to the full as prolific in giving birth to long lines of chivalrous descendants boastful of their origin even though william the conqueror had been william the conquered a change of circumstances which it is quite certain would have made no manner of difference in this respect there was unquestionably a chuzzlewit in the gunpowder plot if indeed the arch traitor forks himself were not a scion of this remarkable stock as he might easily have been supposing another chuzzlewit to have emigrated to spain in the previous generation and there intermarried with a spanish lady by whom he had issue one olive complexioned son this probable conjecture is strengthened if not absolutely confirmed by a fact which cannot fail to be interesting to those who are curious in tracing the progress of hereditary tastes through the lives of their unconscious inheritors it is a notable circumstance that in these later times many chuzzlewits being unsuccessful in other pursuits have without the smallest rational hope of enriching themselves or any conceivable reason set up as coal merchants and have month after month continued gloomily to watch a small stock of coals without in any one instance negotiating with a purchaser the remarkable similarity between this course of proceeding and that adopted by their great ancestor beneath the vaults of the parliament house at westminster it is too obvious and too full of interest to stand in need of comment it is also clearly proved by the oral traditions of the family that there existed at some one period of its history which is not distinctly stated 
a matron of such destructive principles, and so familiarised to the use and composition of inflammatory and combustible engines, that she was called the Matchmaker, by which nickname and byword she is recognised in the family legends to this day. Surely there can be no reasonable doubt that this was the Spanish lady, the mother of Chuzzlewit Fawkes. But there is one other piece of evidence, bearing immediate reference to their close connection with this memorable event in English history, which must carry conviction, even to a mind, if such a mind there be, remaining unconvinced by these presumptive proofs. There was, within a few years, in the possession of a highly respectable and in every way credible and unimpeachable member of the Chuzzlewit family, for his bitterest enemy never dared to hint at his being otherwise than a wealthy man, a dark lantern of undoubted antiquity, rendered still more interesting by being in shape and pattern extremely like such as are in use at the present day. Now this gentleman, since deceased, was at all times ready to make oath, and did again and again set forth upon his solemn asseveration that he had frequently heard his grandmother say, when contemplating this venerable relic, ay, ay, this was carried by my fourth son on the fifth of November when he was at Guy Fawkes. These remarkable words wrought, as well they might, a strong impression on his mind, and he was in the habit of repeating them very often. The just interpretation which they bear, and the conclusion to which they lead, are triumphant and irresistible. The old lady, naturally strong-minded, was nevertheless frail and fading. She was notoriously subject to that confusion of ideas, or, to say the least of speech, to which age and garrulity are liable. The slight, the very slight, confusion apparent in these expressions is manifest, and it is ludicrously easy of correction. Ay, ay, quoth she, and so it will be observed that no emendation whatever is necessary to be made in these two initiative remarks. I, I. This lantern was carried by my forefather, not fourth son, which is preposterous, on the 5th of November, and he was Guy Fawkes. Here we have a remark at once consistent, clear, natural, and in strict accordance with the character of the speaker. Indeed, the anecdote is so plainly susceptible of this meaning and no other, that it would be hardly worth recording in its original state, were it not a proof of what may be, and very often is, affected not only in historical prose, but in imaginative poetry, by the exercise of a little ingenious labour on the part of the commentator. It has been said there is no instance in modern times of a chuzzlewit having been found on terms of intimacy with the great, but here again the sneering detractors who weave such miserable figments from their malicious brains are stricken dumb by evidence for letters are yet in the possession of various branches of the family from which it distinctly appears being stated in so many words that one diggory chuzzlewit was in the habit of perpetually dining with duke humphrey so constantly was he a guest at that nobleman's table indeed and so unceasingly were his grace's hospitality and companionship forced as it were upon him that we find him uneasy and full of constraint and reluctance, writing his friends to the effect that if they fail to do so, and by bearer, he will have no choice but to dine again with Duke Humphrey, and expressing himself in a very marked and extraordinary manner as one surfeited of high life and gracious company. It has been rumoured, and it is needless to say the rumour originated in the same base quarters, that a certain male chuzzlewit, whose birth must be admitted to be involved in some obscurity, was of very mean and low descent. How stands the proof, when the son of that individual, to whom the secret of his father's birth was supposed to have been communicated by his father in his lifetime, lay upon his deathbed? This question was put to him in a distinct, solemn, and formal way. Toby Chuzzlewit, who was your grandfather? To which he, with his last breath, no less distinctly, solemnly, and formally replied, and his words were taken down at the time, and signed by six witnesses, each with his name and address in full, The Lord Nozoo, 
it may be said it has been said for human wickedness has no limits that there is no lord of that name and that among the titles which have become extinct none at all resembling this in sound even is to be discovered but what is the irresistible inference rejecting a theory broached by some well-meaning but mistaken persons that this mr toby chuzzlewit's grandfather to judge from his name must surely have been a mandarin which is wholly insupportable for there is no pretence of his grandmother ever having been out of this country nor of any mandarin having been in it within some years of his father's birth except those in the tea-shops which cannot for a moment be regarded as having any bearing on the question one way or another rejecting this hypothesis it is not manifest that mr toby chuzzlewit had either received the name imperfectly from his father or that he had forgotten it or that he had mispronounced it and that even at the recent period in question the chuzzlewits were connected by a bend sinister or a kind of heraldic over the left with some unknown noble an illustrious house from documentary evidence yet preserved in the family the fact is clearly established that in the comparatively modern days of diggory chuzzlewit before mentioned one of its members attained to very great wealth and influence throughout such fragments of his correspondence as have escaped the ravages of the moths who in right of their extensive absorption of the contents of deeds and papers may be called the general registers of the insect world we find him making constant reference to an uncle in respect of whom he would seem to have entertained great expectations as he was in the habit of seeking to propitiate his favour by presents of plate jewels books watches and other valuable articles thus he writes on one occasion to his brother in reference to a gravy spoon the brother's property which he, Diggory, would appear to have borrowed or otherwise possessed himself of. Do not be angry, I have parted with it to my uncle. On another occasion he expresses himself in a similar manner with regard to a child's mug, which had been entrusted to him to get repaired. On another occasion he says, I have bestowed upon the irresistible uncle of mine everything I ever possessed, and that he was in the habit of paying long and constant visits to this gentleman at his mansion if indeed he did not wholly reside there is manifest from the following sentence with the exception of the suit of clothes i carry about with me the whole of my wearing apparel is at present at my uncle's this gentleman's patronage and influence must have been very extensive for his nephew writes his interest is too high it is too much it is tremendous and the like still it does not appear which is strange to have procured for him any lucrative post at court or elsewhere or to have conferred upon him any other distinction than that which was necessarily included in the countenance of so great a man and the being invited by him to certain entertainments so splendid and costly in their nature that he calls them golden balls it is needless to multiply the instances of the high and lofty station and the vast importance of the chuzzlewits at different periods if it came within the scope of reasonable probability that further proofs were required they might be heaped upon each other until they formed an alps of testimony beneath which the boldest scepticism should be crushed and beaten flat as a goodly tumulus is already collected and decently battened up above the family grave the present chapter is content to leave it as it is merely adding by way of a final spadeful that many chuzzlewits both male and female are proved to demonstration on the faith of letters written by their own mothers to have had chiselled noses undeniable chins forms that might have served the sculptor for a model exquisitely turned limbs and polished foreheads of so transparent a texture that the blue veins might be seen branching off in various directions like so many roads on an ethereal map this fact in itself though it had been a solitary one would have utterly settled and clenched the business in hand for it is well known on the authority of all the books which treat of such matters that every one of these phenomena but especially that of the chiselling are invariably peculiar to 
and only make themselves apparent in persons of the very best condition this history having to its own perfect satisfaction and consequently to the full contentment of all its readers proved the chuzzlewits to have had an origin and to have been at one time or other of an importance which cannot fail to render them highly improving and acceptable acquaintances to all right-minded individuals may now proceed in earnest with its task and having shown that they must have by reason of their ancient birth a pretty large share in the foundation and increase of the human family it will one day become its province to submit that such of its members as shall be introduced in these pages have still many counterparts and prototypes in the great world about us at present it contents itself with remarking in a general way on this head firstly that it may be safely asserted and yet without implying any direct participation in the manbodo doctrine touching the probability of the human race having once been monkeys that men do play very strange and extraordinary tricks secondly and yet without trenching on the blumenbach theory as to the descendants of adam having a vast number of qualities which belong more particularly to swine than to any other class of animals in the creation that some men certainly are remarkable for taking uncommon good care of themselves. End of chapter 1